Okay, good evening to everyone. My name is Malki Weisberg and I work in Yad Vashem and I am in charge of visits and ceremonies in the International Relations Division. I'd like you th to thank all of you for joining us this evening. As you all know, Israel is experiencing a very, very difficult time right now. And we are trying our hardest to keep life as normal as possible. And by having this lecture tonight, and by all of you joining us, you're helping us do just that. We would like to wish a speedy and full recoverer, a recovery to our injured, and our hearts go out to the friends and family who have lost loved ones. Tonight's lecture is a very timely one. The first letters are letters written by survivors after they were liberated between the years of 1943 and 1945, depending on where they were liberated. Dr. Nida Morbieto will bring us examples and analog analyze what these letters teach us. And often we know that survivors are described as depressed and weak and um, no feeling of, of uh, hope. And I think in the letters tonight, according to uh, what I have learned and I know from Dr. Orbieto, we will see that these people were not that, but they were rather people who were courageous. They were anxious to return to life and they were anxious to reunite with their family, their friends from before the war. They were anxious to move on. They teach us the true meaning of hope, hope when so much was destroyed, their past, their lives, their family, they witnessed such horrible, horrible things, but yet they had the will to live. And um, tonight, Dr. Yael Nizam Orbieto will be speaking to us about this unbelievable book. Dr. Um, Yael is the director for the International Institute for Holocaust Research of Yad Vashem. She teaches in the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. Yael's fields of interest of research, excuse me, include Italian Jews during the Holocaust, children during the Holocaust, Jewish leadership, and the Vatican during the Holocaust. Um, among her many pub publications is the one that she will speak about and is edited with Dr. Robert Rosette. And in, the full name is called After So Much Pain and Anguish, First Letters After Liberation. I would like to ask you please to stay muted. And if you have any questions to please place the questions on the chat and we will hopefully have time to answer them. Should we not have enough time, there will be an ending slide that has our email address and you are welcome to write us with any questions and we will try our best to answer them. So I hand over the microphone to Yael and I'm sure you will have a very meaningful lecture. Thank you so much. Thank you, Malki. Uh, good evening uh, to everyone and thank you for joining us. Uh, I'll uh, share my uh, uh, presentation so that, uh, um, okay, I, I hope uh, you can see it. Okay, so uh, the lecture of, uh, of today uh, deals with a very special uh, um, um, kind of uh, materials or documents. Uh, the first letters, first letters that were written by survivors uh, immediately after uh, uh, their uh, liberation. Now, uh, the question of the uh, liberation, of course, is a very interesting one because what happens after the liberation? What is this liberation? Because uh, there are Jews that are liberated uh, at the end of 43, while other Jews in other parts of Europe are still be uh, uh, persecuted and they are sent to their death. So it is a term that is very vague, right? Uh, it's, it, it's very, very uh, uh, crucial to see when each Jew uh, is liberated. And yet we see that immediately upon liberation, many Jews decide to write, to write to, to parents, to write to relatives, to write to their children, to friends, to acquaintances, or to, to uh, uh, Jewish organizations. And uh, the question that, of course, uh, uh, we asked ourselves when we realized the amount, the huge amount of letters that we could find in our uh, archives was, of course, uh, why writing? 
Why do they feel the impetus, uh, the immediate need to write, right? What was uh, uh, the scope? What were the goals of writing uh, those letters, right? And this connects me also to uh, the perception that is still uh, vastly accepted, as Malki mentioned earlier, that the survivors at the end of the Holocaust were so weak, so destroyed, that they were uh, uh, trying their best to start anew, uh, uh, starting the first steps, but they kept silence, right? They didn't want to talk about what happened to them, right? And when we read those letters, we challenged this perception of silence. Did they indeed keep silence? Or can we look at these letters as something uh, very significant that can tell us so much about the way they did the first steps uh, of returning uh, uh, to life? So the first goal of those letters uh, is, of course, giving a first sign uh, uh, of life. And we see in many letters, uh, this is the introduction. The first sentences are very similar to, uh, uh, for example, in a letter of uh, Tsipora Shapira that says, at long last, after time consuming requests, I received your address and hurry to greet you with the first living word uh, from the dead world. So this is very meaningful, okay? A, a living word from the dead uh, uh, world. And uh, in, in another letter, we, 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 see, we see what Yaakov Rabinovich writes, I assume you are not yet aware that I too am among the living, right? So the first, the first need is to let people know that they survived. And in a way, I believe that they wanted to let themselves also know that they actually indeed survived, right? Uh, in another uh, uh, letter, we see um, uh, Yosef Chupak that writes, I, who only four weeks ago existed as number such and such in the concentration camp of Mauthausen, was like the, uh, the other companions in misery destined for the crematorium, but I survived and I'm alive. So it's a cry of, I made it, I'm alive, right? So th this is the first uh, uh, goal. Then of course, there is a, a very important goal uh, of uh, uh, giving the, uh, the first account of what happened, right? Giving the first testimony of what actually uh, happened. So uh, in one letter, we see a uh, Leib Shaus writing, to begin with, I must present to you the tragic report regarding the annihilation of all our friends and relatives. And in many of those letters, we see lists of people that died and they, they go much beyond their personal uh, 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 fa family. They go uh, to describe who survived and who was uh, uh, killed uh, from the community sometimes talking about entire communities. So we see that there is a need to tell, to give the account of what, what happened, right? And in many cases, we see uh, 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 in many details uh, what happened, when did the Germans came, what did they do, what, what, what happened in different times, in, if, in different periods. So it is actually a first historical account the first testimony of what happened in many little uh, shtetl, many little uh, uh, towns, and of course in big cities, this is the first testimonies that uh, uh, are being sent uh, around the world, uh, around the globe, right? Um, in another uh, letter we see uh, uh, that is connected to a very uh, touching story, and this is this uh, a violin here is connected to this story. We have uh, uh, the story of uh, uh, Simezim that uh, uh, what she did, uh, she uh, foresaw the danger uh, of the war and the danger of the uh, uh, Nazi occupation, and she convinced her family to let her uh, uh, two brothers, to let them escape. She told them, please go away, find some way to, to, uh, to rescue yourself. I will stay home with the, uh, with the parents uh, and you will save yourself. And uh, she, the way she did it is connected to this violin because her, one of her brothers was a very talented young uh, violinist. And uh, he, he invited the whole family uh, for dinner. And she told the brother to bring the violin uh, with him. And when they arrived to her house, she explained uh, the way she sees things. And she begged her uh, uh, two brothers 
to leave immediately from her house. Uh, and in fact, the two brothers were convinced, left for the East and arrived to uh, uh, um, USSR. Uh, and there, the brother the, uh, that used to play uh, the violin uh, would uh, uh, play in the streets, you know, to make some uh, money. And uh, one day, a British diplomat saw him and uh, uh, heard him uh, his playing, was so touched by it that he actually decided to help him and arrange for him a visa for England, uh, where he was able to continue his studying in music. And uh, that's how uh, the, the, both the brothers were able to, uh, to remain alive during the war. Uh, the, the sister with the husband and the parents uh, uh, remained uh, in their uh, city in Czechoslovakia. Uh, they were sent uh, to the camps and uh, the parents and the husband of the, of the sister uh, were killed. And immediately after the war, uh, the brother tried desperately to reach uh, some information about the family and was able to send a letter to the sister. And the sister writes to him uh, uh, the, this letter. Um, and, and she writes to him uh, exactly giving the first account. I just want to give you a brief account, even though it will break, I will break down over it. I will only do it because I do not want to leave you in the dark. And then she tells, you know, that, that uh, uh, they, they were sent uh, to Auschwitz, et cetera, et cetera. And then she tells him, Nadenko, we have no mother. She was gassed. The most wonderful and divine has been taken from us in such a bestial way. And then she continues to tell the rest of the family uh, the, that were killed, et cetera, et cetera. So this need to give an account of what uh, uh, happened. And of course, connected to it, there is also the need, the goal of comprehending the tragedy, a, a self-comprehension, right? Telling about it, it's a way to comprehend what happened. Because during the Holocaust, the, the, the each a, a person was so struggling with survival that he was not even able to stop and thinking, what is going on? So immediately upon liberation is actually the moment to do it, right? So, so we see in, in many letters a, an attempt to try and comprehend what uh, uh, what happened, right? So in one amazing letter uh, by Hugo Falkenstein, he writes uh, this, this description, which is uh, amazing. There is no battlefield in history that has not been an epidemic of such proportions and never were so many millions of human exterminated in a mass murder on such a relative small area. With the eye of my soul, I already see the monumental memorials of all nations that lost their best people. So you can, you can see how he develops and he ponders a, a, about what a, a happened. Now, of course, others will try to comprehend it in a much more personal way, right? Like Berti Katz that writes, it is true, we have lost a lot. It, it is in the pits that we have lost everything. I must go on living without a brother, a sister, a mother, a father, and without my little dear uh, children. So this is a comprehension from, from the very personal and private uh, uh, point of view. Um, so what we see, uh, it's the, the next goal that is connected, of course, is the duty to tell and to commemorate, to commemorate the families, the people that were killed, the, the communities that were destroyed, right? And, and th sometimes they even apologize for doing it, as in this uh, uh, letter, when uh, Zipporah writes, please don't be angry with me for having written all this. It hurts, but it has to be written about and has to be known. This is the only thing we can do to honor our martyr victims, right? So, so you, you can feel the need to, to tell about what happened. This is their duty to commemorate the, those ones that were killed and the communities that were uh, uh, destroyed, right? Um, and in another letter, 
uh, and we could of course give so many of those letters. In another letter, Zev Kulbis write, I have been intending to write to you for a long time, but believe me, my strength did not suffice. So you can see the struggle, the inner struggle, right? Every time I took a pen in hand, the dear beloved faces of those who senselessly perished at the ends of these uh, butcher beasts, etc., appeared before me. So I lost heart and could not write to you. But after all, I do owe you a report the last souls who are close and dear to me in the whole world. So I'm making an effort to describe it all to you. So you, you can see how much effort it requests to tell. And yet the feeling, the duty to, uh, to do it is what uh, um, uh, pushes him and, and all the others to tell despite uh, the pain, despite the, uh, the difficulty. And of course, uh, one of the things that we see very strongly is the pain, the pain and the beginning of a process of mourning, a process that is extremely important because if you do not feel the pain, if you do not let yourself mourn, you cannot start walking again. You cannot go on, you cannot reconnect. So we can see that those letters, in fact, are a first step in this process of mourning, in, in this process of expressing the pain uh, to, to themselves and of course uh, outside to the others. And again, as I said before, during the Holocaust, while they were just attempting to survive, they didn't have the chance to, uh, to feel the pain, to, to mourn in the, in the real uh, sense. They, they lived with pain constantly, but they didn't have really a, cha a chance to mourn. And here, through these letters, you can see the process, which is very uh, striking, right? So uh, we can see uh, um, in, in the letter of Berti that she writes, my dear brothers and sister, I am writing this letter not with ink, but with tears. And in another letter, we can see a, a Hirsch Brick that writes, dear friends, I am alive and I'm free. The German bastards have murdered my entire family. Even if I wanted to make a list of all the names of our mutual friends who have been savagely murdered, no paper could absorb the ink uh, it needed for it. Send my regards to all the friends. I am eager to hug them all and just cry our hearts out. So you can you see the need simply to cry, simply to mourn those that were killed and the terrible tragedy uh, that fell upon uh, 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 the Jewish people, right? Um, in, in other letters, we see uh, other angles, right? Uh, Hirsch Rabinovich uh, in another letter uh, uh, writes, I'm without my wife, without my kids. Again, you see the list, without my home. Where did uh, uh, fate dispose of all my beloved ones? Yeah, You must forgive me for pouring my heart out to you. It is not right on my part to do so, but I hope I hope that this might soften my petrified heart and maybe the tears I shed while writing this letter will help me to more easily endure my lonely existence. So you can see how therapeutic it is, the process of writing. It helps him, he is able to, to cry. And that's why he hopes that this might soften his petrified heart, which is, it's a, a, um, a um, theme, this petrified heart is a theme that we found in many letters, this, uh, uh, this fear of the heart that has been petrified by, uh, by the events, right? And, uh, or in another letter um, uh, that writes, very few of our, our acquaintances have survived. We are lonely and devastated. So these are terms that are very recurrent in, in many of these uh, letters and connected to it, connected to the petrified heart, as I said, is, is the question, the fear, am I still human, right? So, and we see in many of those letters, a different aspect of this, uh, of this question that comes uh, up, right? So for example, we see in many letters, as I said, this, this term, my petrified uh, heart. Um, in, in another letter, uh, Azriel Tunic write, yes, my dearest, we are no longer human beings because we don't have any human feelings left except for the awful pain 
in our hearts. There is no solace for us and there will never be until the day we die. And we are strong, yet at the same time, petrified and frozen. So you see this, this difficulty, this, this feeling that maybe we lost it. We lost this human uh, uh, identity, right? Um, and of course, if you read the whole letter, you would realize how human uh, the feelings are, how uh, human the person is, right? And, and even in the same letters, quite often we will see, and we will discuss it in a few minutes, we can find also happiness uh, and solace and, and hope for the future, and we will go to it uh, uh, in a few uh, minutes. In another letter, uh, Sime Zosim writes, no one who had witnessed Auschwitz will be able to become human again in his lifetime. So again, the same fear that appears again and again and again in many uh, uh, of those uh, uh, letters, right? And this is also connected to the fact that when they write those letters, they feel that they cannot really explain what happened because how can you describe what happened right so you can see in different ways people refer to this difficulty in their letters right uh, it is impossible to describe i do not have the words to describe the whole horror uh, of what we have endured or probably you won't understand right even if they describe you will not be able to imagine it, even though you have experienced war. But this sadism was unknown to the world. So this is unprecedented. Therefore, I cannot explain it and you cannot understand it, right? So this is the difficulty that we see in those uh, uh, letters, right? Those who never lived through these experiences are obviously incapable of comprehending them. So I'm not blaming you for not comprehending. It is obvious that you cannot because this is was unknown right uh, to the world uh, before that right or uh, in another letter everything i witnessed and endured during those last four years cannot be told or written down it is beyond human imagination right so this is the difficulty and yet they do it despite the difficulty we see the attempt again and again uh, uh, to write it down and to tell, right? Now it's it's interesting because you do have some of these letters are very short. And in, in some cases, the first letter is extremely short. It's just to give the, the first information, right? And then in the second letter, when they realize that the person uh, uh, received the letter, then they start giving the whole story. And then you can see those those fears coming up uh, uh, in the letter. So it, it it varies from shorter letters, longer letters, handwriting uh, or type, it depends from the place, from the person. And uh, so of course those letters were written in all the languages, uh, the European languages and many of course in Yiddish, but many in, in other uh, uh, languages, right? And um, I, I would connect also these difficulties uh, to, the, to the issues that they are raising, of course. As we said, they are describing, many of those letters describe very, very harsh descriptions uh, that actually, in, if, we, if we see in many testimonies, later testimonies, people would not go so much in details. Uh, sometimes here you have very, a, a, a cruel, cruel a, a descriptions of, a, of the mass killings, right? So this is very, very harsh. And in, in some of these letters, we see also the sign of, um, of guilt feelings, guilt for having survived. And you can see it different, described in, in different ways, right? And it's always very painful. You can, you can read the pain in those in those sentences, right? Like, for example, Tsipora Shapira that writes, I don't know what I should tell you about myself, how I should explain to you the fact that I emerged intact from the Govarayot, from the lion's den, that, that I saw ovens aglow 
and I read glow in the sky that every day I saw thousands of people being led to the gas chamber. There is no point in describing the 10 long months or rather 50 years in difficult, hopeless conditions, worse than for dogs. Of no importance are countless selection. It is of no importance because it doesn't extinguish the guilt incurred by betrayal of everyone and surviving them. So I have to explain to you, I owe you an explanation why, why did I survive, right? So this is, this is so painful, this uh, uh, guilt feeling, or in another uh, letter, Leib Schaus writes, I can visualize the faces of Papa, Mama, Freidele, and it seems to me that they are crying out to me for help, right? So this feeling of why am I not able to help? Why was I not able to help them, right? And, and, and this we can find in many letters in different uh, 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 ways. Now, in some of these cases, the first letter written immediately after the liberation became also the last uh, uh, letter. And we have several uh, cases like that we found in our uh, archive. Uh, in this letter, for example, a very young uh, a woman, Adelaide Brot from uh, uh, Holland, uh, she wrote from uh, Auschwitz, immediately upon liberation, she writes to the family, she doesn't even know really who survived in Holland, but she wrote uh, uh, that she survived and she wrote about all the ones that uh, uh, were killed in Auschwitz. And she writes, I stayed alive because of my willpower, God's help and my unforgettable home, thinking of Friday nights and the high holiday, looking for help to come home very soon. And actually Adelaide, died the very next day after writing this uh, letter to the family. And here we see her uh, in a picture with her parents and with her uh, uh, sister that also was uh, killed in, uh, in Auschwitz and also with the uh, younger brothers uh, that the, the parents and the brothers actually were hidden in Holland and survived uh, uh, the war. Um, and she never was able to reunite with them. Um, and despite this painful this uh, uh, process of writing, despite the pain that uh, uh, emerged uh, from these letters, in these letters we can see so much more. We can actually see the first steps of reconnecting to life, the first sign of hope. And uh, um, for example, in this letter uh, of Sime uh, Zosim, uh, she writes to her brother that we, we already mentioned before, the beginning of the letter is, is this, my dearly beloved Ned, I received your two letters on September 27. And as you know, my birthday is on the 25th. Your letters were the most wonderful gift. Thank you for you have made me very happy. Nadenko, I too would give everything to be able to see you, only to feel you close, to feel your hands without the need to talk, right? So you notice, you have made me very happy. So in the same letter, after describing all the suffering, she is also able to pronounce the word, to, to, to tell him that she was happy. The happiness appears in many of those letters in different ways. And usually it is connected to the happiness of reconnecting to the family, of receiving information, of being able uh, uh, to start a, a new life, right? Uh, in another letter, uh, Hirsch Brick writes to my best friends, your letter is like a balsamic medication to us. We are like little children who need constantly to be comforted. Your letter is so warm, so wonderful, right? So you can see the beauty, the, 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 the very fact that he is able to consider a letter Something wonderful, right? A, some a medication to our soul, to our heart. It is so important. It is so a, a, a reflecting the first step of a new life, the first steps of hope, of finding a strength a, for coping, right? A, in a very beautiful letter a, that a, we find, 
uh, we saw a we saw a letter written in Hebrew actually um, by an Hungarian young woman that survived Auschwitz and was liberated in uh, Bergen-Belsen, and she received a letter from uh, one of her of uh, her leaders in the in the youth movement. This this guy tried to. Uh, to write letters and try to find out who survived of his friends, of his family. And one of the letters reached this young uh, 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 woman um, uh, and she responded to, to the letter. She responded in Hebrew. Uh, and that's what uh, she writes. My dear Dodi, that is a nickname, effective uh, 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 nickname uh, in Hungary. It is strange. When I received your letter, I didn't know what to do with it. Open it, or it's something to toy with, something really joyous. And even stranger, I read your letter over and over, not because I didn't understand it, but because I got happy all over again each time. You may not understand me, those who went through all the German savageries. While we were locked up, we forgot that we are people, human beings. We were no more the numbers, and we didn't matter to anyone. So what happens here, what she's reflecting, is that the very fact that Dodi tried to look for her, wanted to know what's going on, cared for her, that was the amazing thing for Zavit, right? For uh, Because she realized that, that she's important, that she means something. And that is what made her so happy. That's why she needed to read again and again this letter to show herself, to prove herself that somebody somewhere is caring for her, is looking forward to seeing her. And the, the happiness is connected to this, to this feeling of belonging, right? Um, and here we see her, uh, uh, we see the group of uh, uh, from before the war, of course, and, and Zeavit is in this group. Um, since nobody uh, really uh, survived from, uh, uh, from her family, it was very difficult to identify, but the person that actually gave us the, uh, the letter was Dodi, Dodi himself, that received and kept the letter from Zeavit, and he was the one that gave us the, the picture. He was unable to recognize uh, uh, after so many years, but uh, um, he knew that uh, she was in this, uh, in this beautiful uh, picture from, from the youth uh, movement from before the, uh, uh, the war. So connected to, to this feeling of happiness, of, of discovering a connection, uh, it is of course that reflects the need to belong, to belong to somebody, to belong to a family or to friends or to a new community, uh, to a new collectiveness, right? This is what the survivors were striving for to belong again, right? Uh, so in, in, in an amazing letter of the young girl, uh, Helga Rosner, uh, that was only 13 years old when she was uh, liberated, she writes uh, to a family member, to an aunt, uncle in America. She knew that uh, uh, she has an uncle and she wrote to him. And, and she writes, to my great sorrow, I am in the only one of my family who returned. I yearn to find a member of the family in order to belong to someone. And then she writes, I'm Helga, age 13, the daughter of Yidl, right? The, the, the uncle didn't know Helga, of course, but she wanted so badly to belong to a family. So that's what she was doing, so young, but so she knew exactly what she needs to do. She needs to belong to somebody. She needs to reconnect uh, uh, to some uh, family member. In another letter of a young uh, uh, man, young uh, boy that uh, uh, was able eventually to join the Red Army, and he writes to uh, again to his uncle, and he writes, I am the son of your brother, Samuel. It's interesting. He starts from saying who he is. My name is David. You do not know me. When the Germans arrived in 41, they killed the whole family, as well as your second brother, Arya. Please answer immediately and give me your exact uh, address, right? So the need to reconnect, please write to me 
immediately, right? Um, and we can see it in many other uh, 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 letters. This is a letter of, of a, a, an older a woman, she, she was a mother of a young boy that was uh, killed in Auschwitz, and she writes in English, in perfect English, to uh, uh, her uh, uh, aunt, and she writes, Dear Aunt Jenny, it is almost unbelievable that there are still people who, to whom we belong, that are interested in us. I would like to keep the relationship with you. She needs it so badly to keep this uh, relationship, right? This relationship, this belonging, is the future, is the future, is the hope for, for a future. And that's why this is so a, a central for many of, of those uh, a, a, a survivors, right? So um, a, we can see that in, in many letters, we actually see that the survivors relate to the future. They plan for the future, they, they are thinking, where is the best place to go? Should we go to America? Should we go to Palestine? Should we go to South Africa? Should we go back to our country, right? So they are planning and they are thinking, what is the best choice? Usually what it feels like, they are trying to be very practical. Where do I have a chance to, to uh, receive a visa for? Where do I have a family? Where do I have the possibility of reconnect, to rebelong, and to start anew, right? Um, and uh, so, in, for example, in, in one letter of Jane Geismar, she writes actually to the family in France, uh, knowing that her two girls, young girls, were hidden and hoping that they were still alive, right? And she writes, my very dear everyone, she doesn't know even to who she's, she's writing, it is an unparalleled joy to be able to write to you that I am still alive. I'm so anxious to be again among my family and to hug my two little dolls. This separation is very difficult, but we still need a, 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 to have a bit of patience. We are alive and for us, this is, that is what the main thing, right? How many times have I thought of my dear little ones to be close to you? And I wished I had wings to meet up with you. Hug them very tight for me while waiting to be able to do so myself, right? So she is planning, she is looking at the future at the moment where she will be able to hug again her two little uh, uh, young girls. Um, or Olga Klein that uh, writes, Naturally, we would like to go to America as soon as possible because we can't live here with these memories. I know that America is a land of hard work, but you can breathe free, right? So, so for her, this is the important uh, uh, thing. We, we want to reach America because America is, is the freedom, is the future, is building a life anew, a, a and that is why uh, she tries uh, uh, to reach uh, America. Um, or in another letter, Hirsch Brick, that we already mentioned him, that writes, my dearest and beloved ones, I'm waiting for the moment we'll be reunited again. This will be when we live to see our salvation. So we are liberated, but we are not yet in the moment of the salvation. The salvation will be a, a, the moment that we will be able to reunite uh, uh, with them. What is left for us to do is to dream about Eretz, Eretz Israel, and yearn for our home. So building a home is what they want. The dream is to build a home anew. Uh, so you, you see here again the planning of, of the future. And you can't plan the future if you don't have some hope to be able to do it. And we see it so much in those letters. And I must admit that to us, it was an amazing surprise to see in so many of those letters, some has aspects of, of joy, of hope, of relating to this uh, 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 future. And in the last uh, uh, minutes of, of my uh, lecture, before summing up, I would like to refer to another kind of letters that we encounter. Uh, and we decided to include them in, in our book um, because they were very special. It was a very special kind of voice, of first voice. And it was the voice of the soldiers 
uh, liberating the camps, liberating uh, uh, the occupied uh, uh, countries, those Jewish soldiers, American, British, uh, um, um, soldiers from uh, the mandatory Palestine, so Eretz Israel, that joined uh, the British army in order to liberate uh, uh, Europe and in order also to look for their relatives, right? And, and they, when they meet the Holocaust, they, when they meet the survivors, they write letters uh, to their relatives at home and they describe. And those letters are so powerful. They were so shocking uh, uh, to us that we decided to bring also a few of those letters because it gives a different perspective, very, very different from what uh, we discussed until now. And it is the, the, the voice of the encounter with the tragedy, right? Encountering the tragedy. And uh, I'll bring only two uh, of those letters, but, and I apologize that I, I, I bring quite long quotations because they're really a, a something very special and amazing. In one of these letters, Sami Popush writes to his uh, parents, and he says, many times is, since I've come overseas, while miserable in a wet foxhole, I've asked myself, what is it all about? Why am I here? After what I saw the past few days, it seems easy to answer those questions, which up to now seem un unanswerable. And then it describes how uh, it goes into Dachau and they liberate uh, uh, the camp, they arrive to the camp, and he, he finds this huge amount of, of prisoners that come to them, right? That run to them and, 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 and uh, uh, embrace them, right? Hug them. And, and that's how he describes it. They fell on the ground at our feet and kissed our boots and grabbed for, for our hands and kissed them. And these suffering, crying Jewish people yelled, thank God, was the hugging kikumen. Yet then and we're free. And so thank God that you arrived. Now we are free. It tore our hearts out to see people who had suffered so much. And many of us had eyes overflowed with tears. A Jewish man came to, up to me and asked me if it were true that there were Jewish soldiers in the American army. When I told him that I was a Jewish Unter Offizier, right, he nearly went mad. Soon I had about 50 Jewish men and women around me, hugging me and kissing me. And they were starved also for this, this Yiddish, uh, Yiddish gist, right? The, the, the feeling, the atmosphere, the Jewish uh, atmosphere. And I wanted so much to make them happy. So I, su I sang some Chazoini Shtikla, so, so some uh, uh, religious uh, uh, songs, right? And also Yiddish Mame, which is a very popular uh, song at the time. And then he, he, he writes, I saw firsthand the things that I've read about and which I had never quite believed. And this is amazing because this is connected to the whole issue of receiving information, receiving news, and not necessarily believe because it is, as they wrote in other letters, it is really hard to believe uh, uh, what people heard uh, during the, the war, right? But now I know what this war is all about. Now I know why we are fighting, right? So this is an amazing a, a letter. In another letter of, of another a, a, a soldier, a, a, we, we write also similar things connected to the, a, how hard it is to believe, right? And to see what we saw. I've always considered myself, and I think I am a fairly cool person who is more or less indifferent to the routine shocks of everyday living. And so with this confidence in myself, I went to this place today, one of the camps, right? Prepared to see his crematory, the gallows, the torture racks. I even was prepared to see the nude emaciated dead bodies piled three, four and five heights in the street. And then it comes. It was only the living dead that I wasn't prepared for. Those living skeletons with the yellow skin clanging to the bones with facial expressions, expressions that were identical to the expression of those who were piled up outside with the odor that was no different from that of the newly dead. I looked at these men and children starved to the extent that they were beyond treatment, beyond recovery. It seemed superfluous when they told me that many would not be allowed 
alive tomorrow morning. No description can adequately describe the horrors that I saw. And the horrors that I saw were in infinitesimal compared to the actualities as they were. So meeting the tragedy that makes those soldiers realize and they made them actually into a, 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 a carriers of a remembers and of testimony because they could testify of what they saw. A, and I think that those letters were extremely important because they were once on the other side. They heard the information and they didn't believe it, right? But now they, they a, a were able to, a, a, to believe. And um, so when I look at uh, summarize these uh, amazing uh, documents, those amazing letters, we can see several uh, 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 things. Uh, first of all, well, those letters prove beyond any doubt that those survivors had, first of all, they felt the duty to tell, to tell what happened despite the pain the acute pain that this process caused them, despite the fears, the fears not, not to be believed, to the fear that people will judge them. Why did you survive? How come you didn't uh, uh, perish, right? But they did it because they felt uh, uh, such a duty. These letters also show us the need to elaborate the loss, to start this very important process of mourning this is a, a essential in the path to recovery, right? And therefore it also show us the first step, the first step of reconnecting to life, the, the need and the will to, to recreate the bonds with family, with the friends, with community, with collectiveness, right? And in a way, those letters are a very, a, a, a very strong a proof, a, as Malki mentioned at the beginning, that what we have here is we have a collectiveness of, of survivors that are not passive. They are not object of, of the events. They are not, despite their suffer, despite the fact that they went through a hell, such a tragedy, and it's a very prolonged one. It's not a few a, a days or, or weeks. This is years and years of increasing suffering. And yet, despite everything, they had agency. They were able to decide for themselves, to, to think about what is the best strategy? What is the best way? They had it very clear. They wanted to build their life anew. That was their goal. They wanted to, to find remnants of families, remnants of friends, uh, finding a new community to belong to. They knew that this is the first step and they did it on purpose. So in, in quite often we see in, uh, in literatures, in, in, in uh, uh, historical uh, 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 accounts, in research, uh, we find the description of the survivors, again, as, as I said, very passive, right? In some cases, we, uh, we see even uh, uh, theories that say, that uh, suggest that uh, uh, the survivors were used by different uh, 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 um, uh, parts for different purposes and, and uh, uh, scopes, right? Uh, so they didn't really have their own will and their own, own capacity to decide for their own. And I think that those letters uh, are definitely the, the proof that this is so much beyond that uh, these people were actually subjects of their life, of the, of the events. They wanted to take control over, over their life. And they did it in a process that was very natural because they, they, it, it involved, this process involved the duty that they felt to commemorate, to remember, to tell. So we are not talking about silence. There is no silence here. There is an immediate need to document and, and testify. 
and they they knew that part of this process is also to elaborate the loss but also they need to reconnect to life and you know it's very interesting because if you think about writing letters writing letters is is a very uh, central uh, uh, activity of uh, of jews before the war even during the war by the way uh, and not only of jews of course of of, uh, of vast uh, parts of society of course those who who were able to write and 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 uh, and read right so uh, the fact that the first thing that they do after the liberation is finding a piece of paper sometimes those letters are written on little pieces of papers and finding a piece of of a, a, a pencil or some ink to write this desperate attempt to have something to write they need to go back to an activity that was so normal was so part of their identity the human identity, right? This is the first step of reconnecting to life, regaining all the aspects of life that were from before the war, before the tragedy, right? And this is the process that you see. And in this process, you cannot see those, those survivors as passive. They are very active. Now, of course, not all the survivors wrote letters. Some didn't have anybody to write to. Some didn't have the strength to do it. Physical strength, emotional strength. So not all survivors wrote letters. But it seems that this is a very vast phenomenon that uh, uh, crosses the boundaries of social, socioeconomic uh, uh, pre-war uh, uh, classes. Uh, you can find letters of different kinds of Jews women and men, uh, children, uh, older uh, uh, survivors uh, from all the countries, from, in all languages. So this is indeed a phenomenon, an amazing phenomenon that gave us such a treasure of uh, sources that enable us uh, today to have a glimpse on, on their life, on their first step uh, going back to life after the liberation. Thank you. I think that uh, we will stop uh, uh, now. And if uh, there are questions, yes. Thank you so much, Yael. That was just amazing. And you got a lot of thank yous in the chat. And people also described your lecture as sensitive, touching, moving, and powerful tribute to these people. Thank you. Um, most of the questions are really about the letters themselves. Starting with, did you feel a difference in the tenor of the letters over time? People who wrote, let's say, in 43 as opposed to 45. Yeah, well, yes, uh, there are very many differences between the letters. Indeed, uh, the letters that were written at the end of 43, uh, they are very different because they are written while the war is still going on, while the slaughter of Jews is still going on, and they know that. So sometimes they even write to, to family members or to a, a, a friends that are in another country that is still occupied, and they just try to, to their, their luck to see if somebody survived, right? And even when they write it a, a, for, for a, a family or, or friends overseas, they are aware that other Jews are still being sent to the slaughter, that they are still being killed, right? So they, they, the fear and the pain is so acute also because they are inside an ongoing tragedy. It is not over. It is over for me, but it's not over for others. The, 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 one, the letters that are written later, they, 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 they're different because they are able to see the end of the war or the war is all already over, right? So it differs from place to place. There are also differences in age. You can see the younger ones that are writing, the, the, the young uh, Jews that ma many of them joined the Red Army, they talk a lot about revenge, the need to revenge, right? And in other letters you don't see, or maybe they talk about revenge, but the revenge is the life of the Jewish people that survived, right? So building a new, that's the revenge. So it differs very much from letter to letter. 
Thank you. And how did you find the letters? Were they received by friends, family? Um, if it was in the Soviet Union, were they censored? Uh, we don't see that they were set. They were censored, uh, actually, which is uh, uh, because we, we we see those letters are full uh, of appreciation for the Red Army, so they are very uh, uh, enthusiastic about the heroes of the Red Army that that saved us, right? That they 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 freed us. So I, I they, there was no need really to uh, uh, to delete any of those uh, uh, letters or those parts. Um, those letters uh, that we found in our archives, uh, we some were there already for years, but a, a very big amount of those letters uh, arrived to Yad Vashem in the last few years uh, with the, this uh, amazing project, national project that uh, Yad Vashem started a few years ago of collecting the fragments. And uh, this is a national project that mm -hmm. asks people to look under the bed, to look above the, uh, the closet or in the attic and see if there is something left that maybe they want to, uh, to give uh, to, uh, to Yad Vashem to keep it for prosperity, right? So, uh, um, and the amazing uh, uh, enthusiasm of uh, hundreds of, of uh, thousands of documents and, and uh, uh, new documents that arrived in this uh, uh, project uh, brought a huge amount of those first letters that uh, uh, the parents uh, that died uh, kept them. And so usually it's the, the uh, second generation that brought huge amount of documents that the parents kept um, and among them were these uh, uh, kind of letters. Okay, and were they mainly received in Israel or from all over the world? And many of those letters were written to people uh, in other countries, uh, but uh, naturally they were given to us by people that uh, eventually immigrated to Israel. And, uh, and that's why uh, they were uh, given to us uh, in, within this uh, project. But some were given uh, before, and then the, the, the story of the documents, uh, of course, each document has an amazing story. Uh, how did it uh, arrive? Did it reach the person? How was it kept? Uh, how was it brought uh, uh, to Israel, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, it comes from different uh, places. And um, do you have any of the answers that were the people who received these letters wrote back to those uh, survivors? Yeah, we found a few, not, not as many as we would have liked to, uh, but uh, I, I have to admit that we did, uh, uh, we started working on this uh, uh, books already several years ago. Uh, the English version was published in 2016. We recently published the Hebrew version and in some other languages. And since then, more and more letters are arriving. So uh, uh, a, a proper uh, research should be done because when we looked for, for the answers, here and there we found let, uh, answers. And the answers are also amazing, extremely touching. And did you find a difference uh, between men writing letters and women writing letters? Uh, that's a fascinating question. That's one of the questions that we asked ourselves. Can we find a clear uh, difference? It depends. Uh, it, this is one of the factors that influence the writing, uh, gender, uh, let's say, uh, approach. But uh, we, we had to combine it to other factors, uh, age, um, a country of provenance. It, we, we realized that people from different countries wrote in a different way. So it is fascinating how uh, uh, there are different factors that influence the way the letters were written. But there is no doubt that women wrote much more emotional uh, 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 letters, but still we saw many uh, uh, men that wrote and uh, some quotation I brought here that were very touching, very emotional uh, and very strong. So a lot of factors are involved here. Okay. And uh, how did you choose the letters to hmm. study? Well, uh, that was not easy. And here uh, um, my, my colleague, uh, Dr. Robert Rosette, 
who, he was the one who uh, decided uh, mainly which, uh, which letters to, to take. He was trying to uh, choose letters from all the countries uh, because we tried to, to make it as relevant as, as uh, uh, possible. Um, we tried to, to, to include letters of the uh, uh, younger people, older people, etc. Um, we also, uh, uh, Rob also decided to include uh, several letters that were all written to uh, one family in Palestine then, uh, the Leshem family, that were a family of uh, activists uh, in Lithuania, and they had a lot of friends and acquaintances, and they became the, the, the central hub of, of a network of, uh, of Jews from Lithuania. And we saw that a lot of survivors are writing to them. Many of them were very close friends, but many of them were simply acquaintances. And they, they, they wrote to them because they knew them, because they represented somebody, some kind of family, even, even if they were not really family, but they were there in the land of Israel. And they were also hoping to receive some help, some help in reaching uh, Palestine. So they wrote to them uh, amazing letters, uh, creating this network also of the uh, connection. So we tried also to bring that aspect uh, uh, as well. Okay, I think our last two questions are, where are the letters today? Are they in the Yad Vashem archive? Yes. And what languages did you work with? Uh, we, we worked with many languages, which was one of the biggest uh, challenge. Uh, uh, of course, Yiddish, uh, German, Polish, Russian, uh, uh, Dutch, French, uh, Greek, etc, etc, etc. We had them in every uh, language. We needed different translators. We needed to check all the translators. Not easy. It was a big challenge, but I think it was worth it. Of course, we could, every time that we open the, 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 the book, we say, why didn't we put also this one and this one? And why did we forgot this and to include that? But that's the nature of such a work. You, you're never satisfied, which is good, because then it pushes you toward new uh, uh, projects. And uh, we, we are already considering doing a, a second volume. <laughs> that's uh, and the letters today are in the archives? They are in the archives of Yad Vashem. Of course, in other archives all around the world, they can be found. When after I gave uh, some uh, uh, similar lectures, uh, colleagues of mine uh, wrote to me and they said, you know, I never thought about it. And I went to our archive and I found letters. So we can find such letters all around the globe and still, many are still in the houses of, of a, a private people. And uh, I hope that they will be uh, wise enough to give it to some archives to be kept uh, uh, for, for the future. Well, thank you again so much for this amazingly meaningful tribute to these people and interest to all of us. Um, may we all take the hope and courage that Yael spoke about it and use it in our own lives and help us to have a better future. Thank you so much, Yael. Thanks. Good night, everyone, or good afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.